All right, thank you, Anna. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate it. For me, it's, a, it's a, like the banker. I just started two last Monday. And uh, it has been my first meeting in a long time in person, so that's also nice. So basically, and uh, maybe I need to apologize saying that I, I changed the top of my presentation a little bit. I thought that it would be better maybe you can just very broadly and very briefly introduce myself to you guys, talk about my background, and then sharing some of the research ideas that I think it could be important. But really, my one of my main goals today is actually with the possible power interaction. And I also have some survey going on. If you guys don't mind feeding the survey, I have this paper version, but at the end of the presentation, I have a QR code, and then you have also a QR code at the papers. So you can also do that with your smartphone. And, uh, I was happy when I saw in the previous presentation that almost everybody was using the, the step of QR code. So hopefully you guys are somewhat already familiar with this. And I guess before I start, I'd like to ask you guys, does anybody know what is our friend here in the picture? <laughs> the beast. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, Mary, just a power Emma, and one of the goals I'm still kind of the first six months is to understand what are the learning impacts that you guys develop and what are the needs. But I can tell we had together, I think that's probably going to be one of our main, you know, weeks. And uh, I'm definitely going to be putting a lot of my efforts on trying to understand what's happening in terms of herbicide resistance, how can we delay new herbicide resistance, and how can we actually manage the ones that we that are already out there. And uh, yeah, sorry, Jose, it's on me. It's on me. And I really like the, the presentation that uh, from my colleagues before our entomologists, they were singing about vegetables. And uh, uh, I kind of like your mentality, sir. If you get to tell me, I mean, in terms of weeds, especially for bomb if, if I had to ask you guys, what is a vegetable for this guy? Right. Right. So for me, the, the threshold for this is zero. It's not even one in a field. I really think that we should really put in our marketing mentality zero tolerance for <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's what I really need to, need to work on. How can we get back to <laughs> But really, I'm glad you're here. Yes, I know. And I'm, 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 I'm glad to be working on that. Uh, I really think it's a real serious threat to our industry. We really need to put as much as effort as we can. So zero tolerance. So if you don't have it yet, do as much as you can to don't bring it and then and start it. If you do have, do as much as you can to avoid proliferation. Then we, we're going to talk a little bit about that, about that. So basically... Yeah, that's what I was going to wonder if you had clicking capability. So what I have for you guys today, so basically it's uh, I'm going to be very brief, but I just want to cover today a little bit of my background, a couple of the things that I believe are important for my applied research and extension program, and then of course the survey that it's already going around, and that's, I think that's going to be very important for me, like I said, to understand what are the main weed species that you guys are having issues, and also some of the common management practices that you normally get adopt in your weed management program, particularly in cotton and in corn. So, like Isadora, I'm from Brazil. I got my bachelor's in agronomy. And my first interaction with weed science was in 2011. I had the opportunity to come here to the US, and I did an internship in Florida with the University of Florida. So, and basically, we were working with weed management and pastures and range of land systems. So basically, I, I enjoyed so much being exposed, the exposure to with science and research that I did my master's in Brazil, looking at herbicide safety in sugarcane. And then I came back in 2015 to do a PhD with the same professor that gave me my internship in Florida, to working on integrated weed management strategies to control perennial warm season grasses in improved pastures in Florida. It was made by agrass and the grass. Right after my, 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 my PhD, I had the chance to go to a much colder place, a totally different environment and weather. I was in Wisconsin, in Madison for one year and a half. 
And uh, it was a great opportunity. I had the chance to work a little bit more with it. some of the crops that I, I will be also working here. So I had the chance, the chance to work with integrated management on Papa. And we have a, we don't have it here in, in, in Arizona as far as I am aware of, but we need to always be on the lookout. And I'm really planning to put out, you know, factory sheets helping us to understand what are the different uh, characteristics of the different pigweed species, because in, in Wisconsin, we do not have as much power, but we have a lot of, another one, it's called water hemp. It's another pigweed species, and it's a tremendous problem. So I work with the uh, water hemp management, and the Wisconsin is so different that they are not able to establish a path in the fall. So they only rely on spring planting, and that's kind of, kind of an issue because the first year that they plant, they do not have a significant yield. So basically they lose one entire year. So the next year they have some uh, actual production of alfalfa. So a lot of efforts are being developed there with some folks from the USDA looking at, they, they call it inter, uh, interseeded alfalfa, but there are other names you can do intercropping. Basically establish alfalfa and corn together in the spring. So next year, and then in the fall, we harvest corn. So next year, you have full production of water already. And of course, invasive weed management. I think that uh, I'm still trying to quite understand how it will be my time divided. We have so many problems, so many different crops. It's a so, so diverse uh, state. But uh, I do would like to also put some time on invasive weed management. We have a uh, stink net, we have <coughs> progress. So that's another area that I have a little bit of experience in, and I hope to be able to work with you here. And then for the past year, I was a farm advisor in the San Joaquin County in California with Universal California uh, Agricultural and Natural Resource. And it, that was also a great opportunity because the Central Valley in the nor northern San Joaquin Valley, it's a so diversified uh, area in the Agriculture is such a big thing there that it really gave me the chance to. It was a nice transition from my graduate background to have a little bit more experience with the hands on farm, working a little bit more closely with our farmers these days. And, but with that being said, I just had one season of experience in cotton, and the cotton production system, particularly with management in California, it's totally different than here. So, for instance, today they, they have a PIMA. Bottom for is the vast majority, not as much upland. And even the, the little amount of uplands they have, they do not have it, all those herbicide trade systems that we have here. So uh, I have lots to catch up. I hopefully, I'm, by next year, by this time of the year, I'm already putting together a lot of trials at MEC, uh, looking at weed management in cotton. I'm already uh, talking with some of the industry reps, looking at possible collaborations. So. I just want to say that I'm not an expert in weed management in cotton here for the things we have in Arizona, but I, 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 I'm catching up and I will do as much as I can. If I don't know right now, I will talk to my colleagues. And by next year, I will be much more experienced guy, I hope, to be sharing some actually data with you guys. So what about, what do I see? What, what I think would matter for us to focus? So I just put, this is a lot of information. I don't plan to cover all of this. And it's just to share with you guys that I think that I, I have lots of ideas. There are many important things that I think it will be relevant for us that will be meaningful to help you guys with your daily issues. And just because out of that might change based on our service, our, our you know, interactions, I just chose to go a little bit more, to delve a little bit more deeper in just one of those topics, which is herbicide mm -hmm. resistance. So basically, if you think about IPM, you know, integrated pest management, or think about pest management in general, if you look at all those different agrochemical pesticides since the 70s, we can say that, of course, that it will depend on the location, on the cropping season, but uh, on average, we herbicides are by far one of the most widely adopted pesticides for crop production. And well, you know, life always finds a way. So basically, <laughs> we have been over relying on our, you know, not being very mindful or not doing our integrated uh, homework, management homework. And what's happening is that now herbicide resistance is a serious issue. I think we, we warn around. 
Yes, I guess the, 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 those they, days are not going to Absolutely, sir. That's absolutely right. And, and, and we've used it and the people have used all of that. It was under rain. We were late. We did all the things that you have to do to get right where we're at. Absolutely, sir. And thank you for bringing that up. That's, 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 that's absolutely right. And I believe that if you do the same thing with some of those tools that will be totally real life today, and they are effective, it's not about of if, it's about of when. If we don't be mindful with the effective tools that we have right now, we, the same thing is going to happen. Exactly, sir. That, that's absolutely right. And it is my intention, it's my interest to, you know, not just tell you, oh, guys, let's just, you know, put the different modes of fashion, let's do things mixing, let's uh, make sure that our post applications are timely, so we're taking the reason in the air, the, 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 the proper size. But I want to actually see what, what actually works and what is the best way to put together all those, you know, uh, holistic theories that uh, we always talk about. So basically that's, even though the US is the leading country, in terms of hairstyle resistance, that's worldwide. That's not something that's happening just here. We have it, especially in Canada, Australia, and Brazil. And I do like this graph, but that's for me another way to really bring the message home on how serious this is. If you think about the first case of hairstyle resistance weed that was discovered, was in 1957, spreading the, the flower of Chupardit. If you look at where we are at today, we are we have a currently confirmed 515 unique cases of herbicide resistance. So that means we are talking about 263 different weed species that develop in resistance, one or more herbicide size of action. And if you look about the uh, plant uh, types, the majority of them, it's not majority, it's kind of close, but 152 dicots and you know, broad leaves and 111 plants of the hour monocots. And then what about our Herbicide modes of action are think about herbicide chemistry size of, size of action. That we have it as of today 26 known herbicide sites of action, <laughs> and we already have resistance to 23 out of those 26. So, you know, and those type of things they don't come around very often. The, la the latest true mode of action that was discovered was in, in, the, in the 1980s. So, relying there on a new super. Everybody will appear in the horizon. That definitely should not be the mentality. We should do as, as much as we can to keep the ones that we had too effective. And you know, it, it's, it doesn't uh, discriminate crops or countries. 94 different crops, 71 different countries. Well, but uh, everyone does this so well, but uh, we, we have effective tools, right? What about our group regulators? Our, you know, and went to Pardin, they should take care of the job as well. We already have Palmer Amaran resistant. We have it in 2018, Palmer Amaran was confirming resistance in Kansas for 24D Dicamba and two other sites of actions. In 2020, Palmer Amaran resistant to Dicamba in Tennessee. So, guys, like I said, we, but it, so what's the goal? We don't want that to happen here with us, but in order to be able to accomplish that, we need to understand where are we at. If you look at this official website where we can you know, get information about our soil resistance, we have it, they won't, that's all we have for Arizona. We have a Palmer Amaran glyphosate in ALS in resistance from probably 2012. But is it is it really where we at? We are at at this point. So one of the things that I really would like to do this year, and actually I'm already doing that in partnership with Blaze and Naomi. Uh, I want to understand what is the herbicide resistance distribution of our palm amaranth, especially in bottom. So not only where we, we have the resistance, especially for glyphosate and ALS, but what, what about our other chemistries? Do we already have resistance to, for example, our PPO chemistry herbicides? What about our PS2 inhibitors? And what about our growth regulators? And then another really important aspect of Herbicide resistance that I want to cover, it's again developing effective integrated managing strategies that are effective and affordable and you know profitable. So 
In terms of width, width wise, that's something that uh, I really learned that after moving from one state to the other. And every time I move to another state, I, I need to learn with uh, ID biology again from this scratch. It's so different. In the, however, I think from California to here, then we are, there are probably many uh, overlaps. These are some of the weed species that uh, we like to kind of talk about in California that we are concerned. We have a, a red resistance for, like, like for, for example, jungle rice, glyphosate resistance. It's one of the main problems in cotton where I was located in California. And also, what about our horse feed in here, Felipe? These ones are, you know, they, they tend to not be as much as a problem when we have a crop rotation, and especially tillage, because they are very susceptible to the, the seed. The seeds are probably one of the main the strongest things about the horse seed in Herfli Bank is that they can travel uh, very far distances and they're a prolific seed producer, producer. But it's also one of the, uh, how can I say, one of the susceptibilities as well, because it's very susceptible to, it needs to be on the soil surface. So if you dip, if you bury the seeds and also cover crops, for instance, it's a very effective tool. To kind of suppress and, and keep those infestations at bay. Russian thistle, I think that's increasing every year, especially with all those uh, fallow fields that are increasing with other water uh, use restrictions. So I really think that we need to keep, we need to start developing effective tools before it is actually a major problem. And we need to, in order to do that, we need to understand what are the main wins. That's one of the questions that you guys are. Uh, seeing the survey. So what we are actually already doing, so uh, we are placed in partnership with the Ecological Research and Protection Council. They have already been, I don't believe if, if they started this year or maybe last year, but they have been already visiting fields and looking at, you know, giving grades of how badly the fields are infested with palm rabbit. And then uh, I, told, I asked him, since they were already visiting those fields, if they could collect seeds. So they and they basically gave me, I think, more than 120 different uh, locations that they collected seeds. So that's one thing that I'm already going to be doing this year, doing all the herb services experience in the greenhouse, to not only understand how is the distribution of resistance, to what herb size we are already seeing resistance, and then really to you know put the information out there so that it can help with the management decisions that we need to do. What about integrated weed management? So it is very important to have an effective herbicide program. So there are many things that it needs to, to consider. Just think about herbicide program. Probably the number one is the use of pre-emergence or herbicides or PPI. We need to decrease as much as we can the number of plants that will be out there by the time you come with your early or late, late post-application. But herbicide, guys, it's, it's, not, it's not the solution. It's not enough. We really need to put other things together in our, in our, in our entire problem. Well, if you're looking at the physical or mechanical control, there are many things we can do. I'm really interested in learning more about, you know, how many, how, 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 do, how much do you guys like the in-season cultivations and how, how much is it actually a common practice? How many times would you do in a year? I, that depends on the infestation, depends on the site. But I think in our situation, compared to some areas in, in, where, in the Midwest where they do not chew, we have more tools that we can definitely in, you know, include in our integrated uh, management program. One thing that I want to look at is our old wood or plows, you know, deep tillage. That's probably something that is not very popular anymore, but for specifically for Palmer, it is actually a recommendation if in, in, in other states because if you do once every three or four years, if you do every year, that's not good mm -hmm. because you are bringing back seeds that are already born. But if you do once every three years, it has been shown to be a very effective tool. But uh, I want to test it here. And uh, I have been told that we have a, I don't know, it's maybe four or five, maybe, or maybe even more acres at MAC, the Miracle Bank Center where they call it weed nursery. So it's basically fields that we have been watering palm remorant for many years and now is a palm remorant jungle. 
So I think that's a great place for me to start looking at some of those uh, ideas. One of the things before I forget, before I forget that things you don't forget. Um, no problem. That I figured out is on our farm, and I think Marvin has been working on this survey of that. It's a hell of a lot easier to kill those, those palmers if you put the right kind of treatment inside on them. The German is going to use the weight pillar about this big and put it down on them. You can't kill them. Sir, absolutely. <laughs> you just said the number one thing that I believe if you had to say what what else can I do other than relying on our post-summer certificates number one pre emergency herbicide yeah you gotta have a total program approach so pre emergency is the number one thing that we could one could do to help with you know uh, have a better and more effective form control program thank you sir and you know I'm very interested in cover crops and I I, I would really like to Maybe I'm very curious about what you guys will, will, will say. In, uh, I think it's one of my last questions. And I said, do you currently uh, have interest or would be interested in, you know, cover cropping, looking at just for wheat suppression? It's, it's a lot of challenges, but I, I do, do think that, uh, you know, if you can come up with a way that a, a cover crop that produces enough biomass and doesn't require as much as water and uh, we can still plant on our beds and, uh, you know, I think that it's definitely an area that uh, it's it's uh, it deserves, you know, further investigation. Crop rotation, that's another thing. So what are what do we say about crop rotation? Crop rotation, it's a great opportunity for us to bring another crop that has, you know, much more options that are effective that we could use. Corn is a great example. We have our HPPG inhibitors, we have atrazine, but in this case, it's just true. It's a picture from a colleague from North Carolina. And it's basically, in, in this picture, we have it. Uh, it's it's uh, 2010. So here's tobacco and it's that soybean. And then in 2009, uh, so sorry, this is 2010 soybean on both sides. But this, this place in 2009, they have tobacco. In that place, they, they had soybean, so two years in a row, soybean with just relying on glyphosate. And that's, it's, it's hard to see, but that's, you know, nothing but the palmer in here is a, is a, is a clean field. And the thing about palmer is that, you know, you have some weeds, you need, when, when we think about management, you need to, you know, properly identify the weed, you need to understand the biology of the weed, when, it, when does the weed emerge, for how long, and what is the seed longevity. There are some weed species, field bind, field bind weeds, for instance. I believe it stays viable in the soil for close to 30 years. But palm amaranth is a one that if you can have, if you can avoid seed production for four, five years in a row, you can really go back to a place where you might not have as much as a pressure because it's not as long lived as seed in the soil. That's another thing I want to see. If I want to put out some experiments to understand better for how long the seed would stay viable for our conditions with all those <clears throat> different climate and uh, characteristics of this of Arizona. So that's that's the QR code for the survey. That's basically all I have for you guys. And uh, again, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity.